Hi folks, welcome back. Thanks for joining. So today we're going to make milk paint. Now I included a little slideshow here to show you something that you may find interesting about milk paint. This was painted by Michelangelo hundreds of years ago and it's a it's a painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel and he used milk paint. This is uh, I believe this is God touching the hand of Adam and uh, here's a picture from the entrance look at the bold bright colors and it's withstood the test of time this is still bright hundreds of years now Pope Francis recently in 2015 has brought milk paint back into the picture he has decided to do some renovations on the Vatican City including the Sistine Chapel and he has dictated that uh, they will be using milk paint. They, uh, the Vatican, they even raise their own cows and those cows are going to be providing the milk used in the milk paint. So we're going to get started here. Be right back. All right folks, this appears to be a busy little setup right here, but what I have here are the two main ingredients for precipitating the milk protein out of milk. The milk protein is casein. We're going to add vinegar and we're going to um, pull the casein from the curds, from the whey. Okay, now in conducting research on milk paints I've discovered things that we can add to milk paint to enhance its properties. For instance, we can add borax and the borax is going to give it a much longer shelf life. We can also add a bonding agent that will help milk paint adhere to non-porous surfaces. Now ideally milk paint is well suited for a porous surface like rough wood or um, paper. So I wanted to include these in the very first initial look-see of what we're going to be doing here. Now after we separate the protein, the casein, from the whey, we're going to add hydrated lime. Now I don't have any hydrated lime uh, by that name but what I do have here is calcium hydroxide. It's the same thing. So I'm going to be using that. Okay so let's get started here. Okay so we're ready. I've warmed this for three minutes in the microwave and I'm ready to add the vinegar. Now you can use regular household vinegar. I use the industrial strength. I use considerably less. It's of greater value for me, but the household vinegar will work just fine. The white wine vinegar. So to my three cups of uh, warm milk, I'm going to add two milliliters per cup. Now this is a rough um, measurement here. Uh, it doesn't have to be exact. If I get this right you will see the effect of what this has on it. And then when you go to precipitate your own casein from milk you will be able to see here what you're going for. Okay so that is roughly six milliliters of 30 percent vinegar. You may be able to see right away how it is beginning to uh, separate already. And it doesn't take very long and the reaction happens very quickly once it occurs. Now the warm milk is better and this has been sitting for a few minutes so I'm hoping that it's still warm enough for you to get a good picture. And it doesn't seem to be doing much initially until suddenly the reaction is completed. It just pops out. It's amazing. <clears throat> and there it is right there. You see that? You see how the casein proteins have separated from the whey. And at this point it is even a little bit stringy. Now, 
you can purify that even more with uh, by rinsing it with water and another rinse with alcohol to purify the casein even more to make the product that I explained in a previous video called milk stone or Galileth jewelry. So. And that's about all we're going to get here. So I'm going to stop this. All I'm going to do is I'm going to pour this through a strainer with cheesecloth so that I can uh, discard the whey. And what I'm going to save is this. And I'm going to rinse it with warm water. I'm going to chunk it up a little bit more. The smaller curds are actually going to be better when we go to the process when we add the lime, the hydrated lime. Or again, in my case, the calcium hydroxide. They're the same animal. Be right back. All right, let me add a quick segment here. I went to go rinse the uh, the casein, and uh, if you'll recall, I said warm water. I wasn't paying attention, and the water got too hot. And if you do that, it's going to cook your protein, and that's what's happened here. Uh, it's not a bright white like it should be back here. Okay, it has turned a little bit yellow. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to make another batch. But I thought it would be of value to you to show you this. This is a mistake. Also, when you're heating the milk in the microwave, you don't want it to boil. You don't want it to get above ooh, 42, if I recall. You just want to warm it. And when you rinse it, you just want to use lukewarm water, nothing hotter. This batch turned out much better. As you can see, it's a nice bright white and it is not so, it is still a bit goopy and not a solid cooked curd like I showed you before. So now what we're going to do is we're going to set this aside. Okay, now another note to make here is you want to rinse your casein very well. And the reason is you want to wash out all the vinegar. The vinegar is an acid. Now when we make milk paint, we're going to come back with a lye which is an alkaline and you don't want the acid to be upsetting the alkaline. It just doesn't make good sense to do that. So give it a good rinse is what you want to take away from that. Now we're going to begin to prepare the lye. The lime. Okay. It doesn't take a lot. However, Now, uh, there is a book, uh, it's called, uh, if I remember correctly, The uh, the Industrial Uses of Casein. The book is over 100 years old, and I will put it in the links so that you can uh, read the original uh, formulas and patents for yourself. And there's a lot of good information in there, different kinds of paint that you can make. Uh, for different surfaces and uh, now they use the old English so you're going to be going to Google a bit to look up words like I think um, if I can remember one of them I think one of them was uh, sweet water or something like that <laughs> white water I don't know but uh, when you Google it just say okay And uh, so the, the amount that I'm going to be using per one cup of casein is I'm going to be using 7 grams of hydrated lime, or in my case calcium hydroxide. And I'm going to be using 16 milliliters of water to every 7 grams of hydrated lime.
So I'm aiming for 21 grams of calcium hydroxide. Don't breathe this stuff. Don't get it on your skin. Read the packaging. Read the MSDS. If you can get it on your clothes. Wash them before you wear them to the prom. Okay. Now this stuff, it's, it's a little bit nasty. As you can see, there was a little bit of air in there. And typically, we want to get out the air, but this stuff is so nasty, and I'm not wearing a respirator right now. I'm not even going to take the air out of this bag. I just closed it right back up. And we're going to set it aside. Okay. Let me go put my cup away. And to this, we're going to add 16 milliliters of water for every 7 grams of hydrated lime. Now I'm measuring out two milliliters per squirt on this pipette. So I'm going to do 24 squirts. Okay. There we have it. Don't need this anymore. Now what we're going to do, it's not a lot of water, is mix up the lime, the lye, lime, hydrated lime. I'm always getting those two confused, so bear with me. Hydrated lime, calcium hydroxide, you want to get rid of all the clumps. Pardon the squeakies. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add the casein to this. Now, in the original patent, it made mention of having to mix this for 45 minutes. And I agree with that. I am doing a lot of research on this and a lot of trial and error. Uh, They had it right a hundred years ago. You will see other um, videos on YouTube and it looks like they mix this up in a minute. And that is simply not the case. So I'm going to get this started and I'm going to pause the video and when I get this into solution I will return and at that point, what we're going to do is we're going to add some color to it. Okay, the mixing is complete. Uh, 45 minutes. Uh, just a, uh, a gentle mixing. I've gotten rid of... Uh, most of the lumps. Now if you'll see in the picture now, I put these here because if you're going to choose to add the uh, borax to give it a longer shelf time, or the binder so that the, this milk paint can be used on non-pore surfaces, now is the time to add it before the pigment. And the reason is both of these are white.
So if you add the pigment first and then you add this, it's going to lighten the pigment. So if you're going for a uh, an exact color, you want to add all of your ingredients first before you add your pigment. The amount of borax would be one gram per one cup of casein. This would be eight milliliters per one cup of casein. That's what, those would be the measurements for these additives. I'm not going to use those, but you have the information. The next step in this now, and this is a very important step here, is what you want to do is you want to strain it. And uh, I like using an old t-shirt, uh, well washed, uh, virtually lint free. Any fabric that has a, uh, a tight weave, or what they call a high thread count, such as this, or a weave like a stocking that has a very tight knit or high SPI is what uh, stitches per inch which is what's going to uh, be the best for um, filtering this. Okay, so we're going to pour it out. Okay. I've seen a lot of people use um, measurements for their pigments and in my um, little trials here uh, because there is some loss in each transfer of container uh, you're going to need to adjust for that. So my advice there is to uh, wait until you get your strain solution weigh that and then adjust your pigment accordingly so once you get this first squeeze then you'll have an accurate amount to calculate your pigments with Okay, now, uh, again, I like to block the camera, but what I'm doing here is squeezing this out, okay. Now, the re reason this is an important step is because uh, we use the powder, the uh, calcium hydroxide, hydrated lime would have the same effect as a powder, and not all of it is going to go into solution. So you want to remove those solids, those particles and particulates remaining in the uh, solution before you try to use it as paint. Otherwise, it's just going to show up as uh, what uh, a, uh, a rough feel, you know, pieces of uh, whatever in your paint. This is going to give you a more smooth paint when you strain it like this. Okay. There it is. Okay, now at this point, you're ready to add your additives. If you're not going to add additives, which I am not, then I am ready for pigment. Okay, we're going to leave this here because I'm going to uh, strain it again once I get the colorant in there. And I'm going to pause the video here to prepare the pigments. I'm not an expert on pigments or paints or that sort of thing. So I went online and I found some things that uh, um, said the word pigment pretty much on it. So this was uh, pigment powder. <clears throat> and this color is a uh, cobalt blue and this is the one that I've been working with uh, I've made some very nice uh, light blues that you saw in the painting that I showed you at the beginning of this video I came across something that is called a mica powder it seemed uh, fairly safe it is a soap dye 
Now, uh, milk paint has been around a long time, a lot longer than these uh, types of things, and I think that they probably use mineral pigments. Uh, I didn't find any of that online, but uh, I do understand this uh, type of product as uh, food dye. And uh, I know that many artists uh, back in the day of uh, Michelangelo, uh, probably prior to that, they used uh, things like fruit and vegetables to color their milk paints. Today, we're just going to uh, work with this right here. Now, uh, when it comes to pigments, it seems that the best formula is pretty much a 50-50 mix. Uh, so many grams of pigment to so many grams of water. And then you want to add that to the uh, milk paint. Okay. It doesn't seem to take a lot. I'm going to... I really am uh, working on my uh, camera angles, folks. Just give me time to learn how to do that. You know, I'll try to edit some of this out, folks, but... I don't necessarily agree with that one-to-one uh, -one ratio, uh, so let's not go with that. Let's uh, put in the note that uh, you'll have to uh, experiment a little bit yourself to get your color right. Keep accurate notes so you'll know exactly how to reproduce your color per batch of milk paint. Now again, you want to weigh this after you've screened it. You want to uh, this, add this as a liquid, not as the straight powder. Uh, didn't seem to work very well. And once you do that, there's the basic formula. So now what I'm going to do is I am going to screen it one more time um, and that is going to get out uh, any remaining particulates and undissolved particles so that we have a smooth paint. One of the things that you will notice right away about milk paint is that it works very differently than what you used to for uh, latex and that sort of thing. This is a natural product uh, using uh, non-toxic components. One of the, a few of the benefits of using milk paint is that it is non-toxic and it has zero VOCs, uh, all natural ingredients. Uh, And uh, it's very durable. It, uh, once applied, 
and protected from the elements, it will last hundreds of years. It is not waterproof. Uh, there's an additive that you can add. Uh, some people use linseed oil to add uh, durability to it um, or uh, a waterproofness to it. Or um, you can uh, coat it with something like shellac once you're done, a clear shellac to protect it from water. When this dries it'll be rather uh, flat. Uh, now depending on the additives, once you add the uh, binding agent uh, such as the PVA glue, you will notice a slight sheen to it. Now one of the things that makes paint uh, more water resistant, of course, is the sheen itself. It simply doesn't hold water. So. will have that benefit. There we have it. Milk paint. Let me see if I can find something to brush on. And you can see. <coughs> All I really have handy is a piece of paper. Hopefully there's no wax on it. This is rather thin. So you can uh, you can adjust um, the amount of water. Uh, you can squeeze out more of the water from the casing before you add it to make it more thick. You can add uh, a little bit more lye. You can add more casein. And um, at this point, this would be more like a glaze. So uh, if you put this on wood, the grain would still show through. And if you wanted to add additional coats, it would be um, a more solid color. So it's an earthy product. It's going to act differently than what you're used to. But there we have it. Milk paint. Non-toxic. No VOC. Natural ingredients. Good for the environment. Mix it up in small batches as you need it. The artist in you can develop your own color palette. Alright folks, so there we have it. Milk paint. Non-toxic. Zero VOCs. Made from in natural ingredients. A paint that is durable. It can last hundreds of years. It's been used as far back as the Egyptian times. Now, uh, there have been a few subjects that you folks have asked me to look into that I've enjoyed researching more than milk paint. And there's a lot of information out there. And this is a good bit of misinformation. So I'm going to leave you with the book that I found online that was invaluable to me in learning the process of making these uh, casein products. Again, you're going to get have to get used to some of the old English. Okay. Um, and you'll see what I mean when you read the book. All right. So uh, let me give you just a, a few little takeaways on the uh, making of milk paint that are important. Uh, for one, the warm milk, if you're going to precipitate your casein from milk. Now, again, if you don't want to precipitate casein from milk, our friends at Noble Elephant, uh -huh, they provide casein already in a powder form. I did not do any experiments on this. Uh, well, not for this video but it works very well. It's going to save you some steps. It's more controllable and um, as you can see this was rather thin 
Now, if you're using the straight casein powder, it's a very quick adjustment to increase the viscosity. So I would actually recommend this. Okay, another takeaway is that straining it is very important. You'll definitely want to strain it. And you can't strain it too much. Okay. The amount of pigments that you use, you use enough. If this is too dark of a blue for you, for instance, I would suggest adding a white pigment, not using less blue. Okay, I hope this has been enjoyable. I hope you get out and you try this and you can see how much fun this can be. And if you like this video, um, please subscribe to that little green dot. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.